Get him the f out of here. I'm sorry. F I'm, so I'm not f kidding me. We're not going to do the whole thing. We'll cancel the whole f show. Godfrey Daniels. Oh, we got a classic on our hands. I'm excited about this one. The second annual On Cinema Oscar special really sticks out to me and is always one of my favorites to rewatch. This is likely partially because it was the first Oscar special I ever watched, as well as one of my very first introductions to On Cinema in general all those years ago. A young recruit, inexperienced and naive, stumbled across this beautiful, silly disaster ripe with stunning displays of incompetence and vanity, accompanied by random overlays of Hobbits and Billy Crystal, and needless to say, I was hooked. I couldn't stop laughing at the simple absurdity of the concept, the fundamental misunderstandings at its core, the constant personification of Oscar as though there's some omnipotent Hollywood godman named Oscar for which this live stream is some sort of bizarre cultish ritual. It's an exciting year for Oscar. Viva el Oscar! I found it hilarious to imagine what possible value an Academy Awards viewer could find in watching a simultaneous live stream of a drunkenly disheveled and impatient man singing Oscar carols, loudly hey. eating Chinese food, and throwing things, while another man in a Hobbit costume Doom rants about Peter Jackson and argues with the host. I was blown away at the creativity and insanity of these two hours of live show shenanigans, and I couldn't believe something this funny had escaped me up until that point. All these years and a meteoric rise through the ranks of the popcorn monster military later, I actually still think this Oscar special minute for minute might be the funniest one of all of them. Join us live for the second annual uh. Oscar ceremony, uh, which is starting right now. And the Oscars start right now. There's just so much to talk about here. In my last video on the first annual, I talked about how it was the simplest version of the Oscar special concept and brought up a number of elements that were established then that would continue on to be staples of the Oscar special canon. The second doubles down on those aspects while arguably introducing more iconic lore elements than any other Oscar special. One of the elements established in the first annual was the way in which, because of its live format, the production itself becomes a part of the story. As things go wrong, the characters react to the developments in real time in hilarious ways. It's much more relevant this time around as the second production is considerably more elaborate than the first. Gone is the lo-fi DIY charm of the first special, as well as the max 360p resolution. Instead, the second annual sees a major upgrade in production quality. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in HD mode. Something I've always been fascinated by with On Cinema is how these characters just fail up continuously. I'm not sure what it was about the first Oscar special as a proof of concept that could possibly lead to more funding or more confidence on Tim and Greg's part. However, here we are a year later, at it again with new sponsors, more guests, a bigger team, and new technology, all of which lead to more problems that make the show even less successful. It is quickly clear that none of the many issues that plagued the previous broadcast have been addressed. Rather than learning from these mistakes, all of them are repeated, and more and more elements are added as if the previous year had gone well and they're ready to take on more. It's the definition of insanity wrapped in completely misguided ambition. Rinse and repeat for 10 years. There's now more polish, but an even more chaotic and unprofessional turn, as the pretense is quickly chipped away and the rotting core that is this concept and its creators is revealed. Who's just yelling at everybody and just spilling stuff and not doing any of the segments that we planned on. You know. Because of the first annual's low resolution, simple set, and poor audio quality, it's not necessarily surprising when the evening quickly goes from pointless to disastrous. But with this fresh coat of paint on the second annual, the expectation for quality of substance is naturally set higher, and all of the flaws at its core become even more pronounced. We either proceed this way and lose our entire audience. Well, this is not working. So I know it's not back. working. In the first annual, Tim gets drunk and throws up into a box on a dirty floor in ultra low resolution in front of a cheap, tiny set. In the second, much more high-definition broadcast, Tim gets drunk and pees next to a touchscreen monitor in front of a media control room. Hey, Cancel the show. Both are insane things for the host of any show to do on a live broadcast, but with how much more effort clearly went into the latter production, the behavior feels so much more out of place and inappropriate. In real life, coming across the first annual, you'd write it off as a couple of idiots trying their best. Come across the second, you'd likely be completely confounded, asking questions like, who is funding this? How is this possible? Why is Sally Kellerman involved with this? The Oscar special trademark gradual decline into chaos is even more significant and funnier when the show begins with more promise as it does here. I know everything's gonna go really well. The additions here actually end up detracting from the show, as everything is so incompetently executed and rarely goes to plan. Speaking of the touchscreen monitor I just mentioned, 
Tim introduces it at the start of the show as a high-tech addition that will be crucial to making sense of all the data they'll be getting. Big change for us, a lot of new technology we're using. He's so clearly proud of this setup as a status symbol for the show and speaks of it as if it's the cutting edge of technology, referring to it as the nerve center of the On Cinema Oscar special. The promise made is that this system will be used all night as they talk about the awards. Who's the best actor? Who's the worst actor? First off, this is absurd, giving their actual insights into the Oscars are largely limited to the likes of speculating about The Hobbit 2 winning awards it wasn't nominated for and bad-mouthing Ellen DeGeneres. Ellen DeGeneres has never mm. been in a movie, never won an Oscar. Well, it's She's true. She's a TV it's person. A great pers I'm not entirely sure how a simple touchscreen list of nominations with pictures of the actors was meant to assist in these points. It's presented as a major upgrade to the Oscar special format and hilariously flops immediately when it doesn't work at all. I want to take a look at Matthew McConaughey. Okay. Swipe, swipe out of that. Is it, it's uh, operating on its own here. Time has been dedicated to hyping up the system and literally all it adds to the show is an awkward and embarrassing few minutes of struggle. At this point in the show, Tim is patient enough to brush this off and move on, but the technical problems continue to plague the production throughout the evening. They bring out the worst in Tim, as his ambitions for this much more elaborate Oscar special are met with a series of failures. Your interview with Jonah Hill. Larry Terman. Okay. Okay. Fix the f***ing feed before you go tell me it's on. I'll talk about Tim's behavior a bit later, but first let's quickly pivot and address some important new additions. We don't need to hear music. Uh, during the, what, if a number is best song, they should have music. But not on for this, uh, uh, going on and on and on. The first one I'll mention is introduced right at the start of the show and remains important through all of the subsequent specials. Music. More specifically in this case, the debut of the Oscar Fever song. I want to start things off uh, in the tradition of one of my favorite Oscar hosts, Billy Crystal, with a song. So here's a song about Oscar. Tim kicks off the show with a song he wrote that's essentially a nursery rhyme about the Oscars sung over the goofiest stock music imaginable. I've got the Oscar fever. No matter how many times I watch this, I seriously cannot make it through this song without laughing. So it's no wonder one of the actors would be seen cracking up in the background. This moment is important for a number of reasons beyond just being stupidly hilarious. Number one, the song itself is absolutely iconic and has become a beloved running joke in the franchise as it's reprised not only on the other Oscar specials, but, but multiple times on this very same broadcast. Yes, I do. Each time more unhinged as Tim gets drunker. Oscar fever. Number two, it establishes Tim's obsession with his own music and his belief in his talent as he continually harkens back to it throughout the night, praising his own performance in a self-aggrandizing way. I can sing too. My song up against Farrell's song, my song would win nine times out of ten. People are saying that I might get a Grammy for it. Number three, it sets up a larger trend in on cinema as a whole. This is actually the very first inception of a long-running point of contention between Tim and Greg. Tim's desire to incorporate music into everything, and Greg's insistence that music has no place in the world of film criticism. Knowing how prominent that through line is, the significance of this moment on the second Oscar special is clear. It's a precursor to Tim's music career with Dakar and DKR, and foreshadows the obsession that will lead to the events of the Electric Sun Desert Music Festival and more. My predictions are very interesting. It simply wouldn't be an Oscar special without these inane ramblings I refer to as Oscar talk, an element that was established in the first annual I'm an Oscar booster that is back in the second with a vengeance. If you look at the movies this year mm -hmm. that are up for Academy Award, a lot of them are movies that people don't like to see. Crude's was the best uh, picture of the year in terms of cartoons. Year after year, I keep asking myself, why do I even bother? Who cares? Yeah. yeah. But, um, well, because it's the Oscars, you gotta watch it. Congratulations to all the losers who won. M Matthew McConaughey, uh, you're nothing to me. 12 Years a Slave, I didn't even see. The winner of this should have been Chinese Zodiac with Charlie Chan. This special is when we really begin to see Tim's limited interest in the Oscars lose out to his focus on extraneous topics, much to Greg's dismay. For example, throughout the night, Tim won't stop talking about politics and the impending wars and disasters he foresees. Global politics, nuclear apocalypse, turn on CNN or Fox News. Putin has done something very unusual. Right Independence there. Day, did you ever but, see uh, that? Crimea, in Crimea, Crimea River, the way that Obamacare is handling the whole situation. Duck and cover and... Uh, China the, Syndrome with Jane Fonda. Mm -hmm. So, uh, nice knowing everybody. Eerie current day parallels aside, it's so self-indulgent and ill-informed, and not to sound too much like Greg, would be really out of place on a show like this. This is one of the best early examples where you can really feel Tim's restlessness in the confines of the show's concept and his desire to pull away into other territories. We are done for, in, um, probably by the end of the week. 
This feeds into a really fun level of conflict between the two in this special, as Greg is constantly protesting Tim's priorities passive-aggressively. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see uh, how Putin can Or it doesn't take a play. rocket scientist to see that Hobbit 2 is really what we should be talking about. It's not an Oscar matter, oh. it's a news matter. That's why we're not going to focus on People can tune it, into CNN.com and watch and find uh, out about that. Well, we're not going to dwell on it. We're in here and watch about we're the not Oscars. Gonna, I wanted to get my two cents out. That was five cents or ten cents. Okay. Though there's probably less time spent actually talking about the Oscars than the year prior, somehow there's quite shockingly even more Hobbit talk. Greg's belief in the legitimacy of write-in candidates for awards has been established. Those nominations are simply suggestions. Thank God for write-in votes, telling the Oscars that they want Oscar to win. And despite being entirely wrong just last year, his pick this year is a Hobbit movie again. This is gonna be the year that Hobbit 2 surprises everyone. To people that are real movie buffs, movie experts, it's not a surprise. Uh, this was the best movie of the year. Not only does he yet again find every opportunity to make this supposed expertise-driven Oscars commentary show about the Hobbit movie he likes so much, but he does it even more frequently, making bolder claims. You're gonna see a sweet not just with Best Picture, but Best Actor, mm -hmm. Actress, and, and a lot of the other categories, the smaller categories, Director, uh, Makeup, that kind of thing, too. In the first annual, Greg sits around obsessively droning on about The Hobbit, a harrowingly emotionally stunted display. In the second annual, he does the same, but he takes it to the next level by doing it in a full-on Hobbit costume, complete with fake hairy feet shoes and a long pipe. I didn't know it was Halloween. This is something I might be wearing tomorrow as well. well after Tell me Hobbit a little bit about this outfit. The, uh, you uh, obviously are. He even introduces his Hobbit heads, Hobbit cosplayers that he brings to the studio. While the first annual Oscar special had only one guest in studio, John Aprea, the second steps it up in that regard as well. This special is the point at which Joe Estevez is cemented as an important reincurring character on the show. Flexi! That is terrific. <laughs> Brought on as a main guest to talk about his role in the upcoming series Decker. What is it like working on Decker and, uh, how do you like working on Decker? This is the first time we see Joe being subjected to the true on cinema experience, complete with undeserved anger and disrespect from Tim. Best picture, 12 years a slave. Okay, no. My final warning to Joe Estevez, I'm gonna ask you to all leave. Another guest is Sally Kellerman. You can call me Sally. It's always hilarious to see what random Oscar adjacent guests they can secure, and she acts as their big celebrity guest this year. I'm always impressed with her in this as an actress from another generation so seamlessly fitting into this odd alternative internet comedy world. She's dead? Helen Hayes Well, then I can dead. say this. She's I'm glad dead. she's dead. I hope she's not. Well, that's nice. Well, I'm glad she's dead now, too. That's so right. That she doesn't have to hear that. She so obviously gets the joke and is in on it and manages to hold her own delivering a very funny performance. And the fact that she continues on to be part of the Decker series is just awesome, and commitment to details like that is a big part of what makes this universe so fun. I want to thank Beth Mittler for coming on the show, or Sally Kellerman for coming on the show. But those guests are not what I want to focus on at the moment, because perhaps the second annual's greatest contribution to the world of on cinema is the introduction of a certain W.C. Fields impersonator. My favorite non-Tim and Greg on cinema character has to be Mark Porch. Uh, Porch. Uh, Porch. Wedding drinking is one of the easiest things to do. I've done it a thousand times. I still vividly remember watching this Oscar special and crying laughing at this character. This was before Better Call Saul and way before What We Do in the Shadows, so I was completely unfamiliar with the magic of Mark. It's one of the most absurd and surreal performances. What I love about Mark is that the character underneath these terrible, terrible, over-the-top and bizarre impressions is quite reserved and awkward and realistic. It's somewhat unclear, which makes it so funny to imagine what his own perception of his impressions is and how others perceive him, that he somehow keeps getting work as an impersonator. It's hard to gauge because Tim always ends up hating his impressions, yeah. Leave. but always bringing him back for more. Joe Estevez is clearly sold, as he doesn't even recognize Mark from impression to impression. Looks a lot like W.C. Fields. That was the same guy. Oh my getting, goodness, the same fella. For our I begged them to get us like three or four talented, people talented to do. Guy. Experiencing this for the first time was so fun. The way that Mark begins his trademark half trivia, half lazy impression stick. If I were to nominate one of this year's movies, it would have to be Poppy by me, 1936. Mm. And the way Tim from the start seems unconvinced and gets impatient and distracted, requesting other impressions from him. Do you do a uh, Jim Carrey impression? All righty then. Mm. Smoking. Do you do a Robin Williams impression? Or as Robin Williams or as Mark? Um. Oh, hell. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh. Oh, Very boy. Very good. All right.
angrily criticizing the way he's performing. If you're gonna do Chaplin, say something. Don't just do the, don't just mime around. I, Come with a bag of tricks, but yeah. make them tricks we can use. Okay, sorry, Tim. Eventually throwing things at him. And Mark's reaction to all of this as a new recruit to the On Cinema family, it's all priceless. One of my favorite ways in which Mark's impressions are used in these shows is when they cut to them after shit has hit the fan or things have become so chaotic that a distraction is needed or Tim is otherwise unavailable to keep the show going. This is the case here and one of my favorite examples. You watch Mark doing this absolutely absurd Charlie Chaplin routine for what feels like 20 minutes over this happy, dorky, ragtime piano music directly after Tim has had a complete meltdown. It's such a great contrast of the show being so off the rails and disastrous, and we're completely aware of the turmoil, but watching this cheerfully cringy performance. The producers are just dangling and jingling Mark as keys to a baby to distract from the embarrassment of this broadcast. And imagining what Mark must be thinking while he's doing this always makes me laugh. A big part of my love for this special specifically is Mark's spectacular intro, especially rewatching it after seeing everything else and knowing what a hilarious and important asset he is to this universe. Another crucial component of the Oscar special is the segments, often produced by Greg and deeply regretted by Tim. The tradition of Tim not watching or approving Greg's segments beforehand and then getting mad is continued here. Greg presents an Oscar on location segment that almost exactly mirrors the pointless, plotting, incomprehensibly edited segment he presented the previous year. Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit will be on this wall of fame as well, probably in that spot right there. But instead of talking about The Hobbit, he's now talking about The Hobbit 2. Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, and they've even left a little space up there at the top in which to honor Hobbit 2. Tim chastising him for this is one of the first inklings of conflict between them near the start of the show. Very similar to your last year's report. <clears throat> Entirely consumed by his Hobbit obsession, Greg continues to work the Hobbit into the other segments he presents at every possible opportunity. Potentially my pick for the most ridiculous moment and biggest laugh in this insanely funny special chock full of both is later in the special when Greg presents a segment that he produced as a premonition of Peter Jackson winning the Academy Award for The Hobbit. Putting aside for a second how bizarre and pathetic it is for a grown man to care enough about a Hobbit movie winning an award to produce something like this and insert himself into the fantasy, the way it's produced is just preposterous. The cutout heads of Greg and Peter Jackson overlaid onto the awards footage, the moment when the Peter Jackson cutout suddenly and inexplicably changes to an older, scruffier Peter Jackson, the text-to-speech style inhuman voiceover, Hollywood's number one film buff, Greg Turkington. You will always be the number one Hobbit head in my book. The fact that the dialogue itself seems to be written by a robot whose second language is English. See you all next year when The Hobbit 3 wins the Oscar award. As with Oscar on Location, the production value of this is incredibly poor, and it brings up something I've always found fascinating with these characters. Greg claims to be this unparalleled film expert, and yet the content he produces always lacks even the basic common sense tenets of quality. On the other hand, Tim's productions, while equally insane and still terrible, are far better constructed from a technical standpoint. Earlier in the show, Tim produces a similar segment to Greg's Oscar premonition, which is his fantasy of winning an Oscar for Tim's Story directed by Tim's Story, a joke which can be traced back to a previous episode of On Cinema in which this connection is made. Directed by Tim's Story. I like that, Tim's Story. Almost as if they made a biographical picture about myself, you'd call it Tim's Story. Well, I think you'd call it the nut job. It's one of the funniest, most embarrassingly childish and vain things he's ever done. Julianne Moore is here with me tonight. Love you. And I'd marry you all over again. <laughs> but there's so much more effort put into the basics of production than in Greg's segment. It similarly inserts him into archival footage of the Oscars, yet in Tim's, he's actually keyed into the footage, whereas Greg's just uses poorly overlaid static images, like a worse looking version of Saddam Hussein in South Park. Unlike Greg's, Tim's segment actually has live audio of his performance. Tim's story is a terrific director. I think he's greater than any director has ever lived, including Martin Scorsese and Robert, uh, uh, Hitchcock. This is a hilarious detail that's pretty consistent to this day. Case in point, the recent deck of cards in which Tim's part looks like this, and Greg's looks like this. Perhaps an intentional commentary on the loudest critics being the least capable of creating themselves, or perhaps just one of those hysterical details that makes this universe richer and more dynamic. Either way, both of these segments and the comparison between the two are some of my favorite ever Oscar special moments. This Oscar special is Tim and Greg's first clear attempt to mirror the actual Academy Awards in terms of presentation. Like they're trying to actually replace the Academy Awards by making their own comparable show. This becomes more significant in the next special, but it's interesting to note now nonetheless. 
All of their cues for this are clearly being taken from a surface level viewing of the Oscars. The first example of this is Tim's Oscar Fever song to open the show, an attempt to mirror an Oscars opening number. Later in the show, there's a segment in which they honor those that have passed away in the previous year. This is a wholly unnecessary and poorly handled direct parallel of the Oscar in memoriam segment, though its presentation is somewhat less graceful. Oscars lost heroes, and Oscars lost hers. Is This is the segment about them passed on. People had passed on and died. It's executed so clumsily to the point that this holdover image of Steve Harvey from their previous discussion topic comes up, accidentally but clearly insinuating that Steve Harvey has died. There's another hilarious example that becomes an Oscar special mainstay going forward. Again, in an odd attempt to morph the Oscar special into something more like the Oscars itself, Greg prepares his first Oscar surprise. Throughout the second annual, there's so much build up to this. It's gonna blow people's minds. Probably the greatest finale to any variety special, any award show ever presented. You will not be disappointed. It's hyped up as an Academy Awards level spectacle. Big Oscar production number. So we don't always have the budget to put together a big, bombastic, spectacular finale, but I've done it tonight. Coming up later, we'll have Greg Tarkington's big surprise. We'll see how good that is. When the time comes, a comically slow curtain rises to reveal the word Oscar misspelled in VHS tapes. It's spelled both ways. Which are then knocked over for a domino effect that does not work properly. They all would have gone down if you would have spelled it right. Because of all the build up to this and the claims of its impressiveness, when the time comes and Tim is so deeply upset by it and with Greg for letting him down. I want to thank Greg Turkington for embarrassing himself. He is no longer part of On Cinema. He embarrassed me for the last time. That was a joke. He's told me that it would be something that would blow my mind. It was worse than the Chinese food I ate, which I already had diarrhea twice from. It's the final nail in the coffin of failure to live up to their ambition. The surprise sends the evening out not on a high note, but rather on a note of drunken, exasperated defeat and contention, and into a nightmarish edit of Hobbit and Charlie Chaplin images with Hobbit-related sound bites. These surprises and finales are always a point of interest in the Oscar specials, and this one hilariously sets the tone for the insanity that is to come in later years. Even before this, Tim's patience is at an all-time low in this special. Talk about that for just one second, and we have very little time for that, but go ahead and talk about that. Just try to keep it very brief. And he's yet again drinking champagne, unable to do so in moderation. I did get out a, a hand a little bit last year. I haven't drank, had a drink all week, or all year, and um, I'm uh, going to have one or two tonight. I'm going to have more than two glasses of champagne. Ugh. This all leads to a display of the absolute worst behavior we'd seen from Tim up until that point. Rather than account for the technical or logistical snags by using his charisma as a host to gracefully pivot or keep the show going, Tim's defense mechanism is to point fingers and assign blame live on air. One of his biggest targets is the crew. As the first annual hinted at, the crew and production itself becomes a part of the story in the Oscar specials, and the second annual takes it to a much higher degree as Tim is constantly breaking the fourth wall and berating the crew throughout the night. You didn't even tell me the name of the restaurant chinese food that's all i know is chinese food we get the music ready as soon as i start singing who's gonna win that should be cued to go Our champagne right now open it off camera don't be an asshole the people that work for this show uh should go should uh should not be able to sleep tonight because all they're doing is uh is ruining things for, for us lashing out at the people who make the show like this is one of the least professional and most disrespectful things i could imagine a host of a show like this doing and it's a great example of how much fun the creators had with not just making a live show but with setting these characters up for failure and making their own and seeing how they would handle themselves he even begins to disrespect the sponsor of the show between loud mouthfuls of chinese food that's bad. Like There's something eight. off about that. It really feels at times like a genuine production gone wrong as we get glimpses of the guests reacting in the wings or Greg poking out from hiding behind the curtains. Tim seems to be irritated with everything and everyone around him. Put the pipe down, please. Uh, stop for Joe really talking. Quick. When I start talking, immediately stop. You don't interrupt me ever again. But cannot see the hypocrisy in his complaints. He's furious with Jared Leto for his disrespect of the Academy Awards, yet he himself has been disrespecting his own show and everyone involved all night long. He's upset about songs being sung on the Academy Awards. I just think it's obnoxious to come up on stage and, and start singing like that. Yet he himself has been subjecting everyone to his own music over and over. The drunker he gets, the worse his behavior becomes, and he gets very, very drunk. The first annual showed us that stretching the format of the show into a multi-hour live broadcast came with challenges for those involved. Tim's inability to hold it together for that long, and Greg not being prepared to deal with it. This time, Greg is not only prepared for Tim's drinking, but unafraid to challenge him on it every step of the way, in the most hilariously dry and sarcastic way possible. I usually <laughs> sleep in later after you've been drinking so much. And he could be the co-host when you're in rehab. I think I'd be a terrific guest on one of those political oh, shows. I think if you didn't drink fantastic. so much, you would be. Uh, what is the name of the program? It's two letters that you should probably enter 
uh, next year before SAG. We, uh, do one of these Oscar Screen actors ceremonies say two letters. Tim childishly takes his drunken frustration out on everyone around him and is intensely displeased with everyone's contributions. He doesn't like Greg's segments and mocks him for his costume. Thank God that you're here, Greg, in your uh, stupid Hobbit costume. He's ungrateful for the gift that Joe Estevez gives him. Uh, I don't like it this crushed, but well, I like it, um, okay. the seeds. He's unhappy with Mark Proch's impressions. When it comes time for Greg's big surprise, Tim is so hammered that he starts putting on a weird accent and screaming about God and gumbo. Greg Turk and Tim's big surprise! Hey gumbo for being there! Thank you gumbo for making yourself so f delicious! Ooh. I still don't quite understand what the hell is actually going on in Tim's brain here, but it's so endlessly funny, especially because he's so mean-spiritedly interrupting and mocking Greg, who's just been let down by the loss of his beloved Hobbit movie. Uh, Hobbit lost tonight, Greg. How's that sit with you? Greg is trying to present his big surprise to the world, but is being steamrolled by an angry, inexplicably southern-sounding tantrum. Thank God for Greg Turk and Tim for coming on the show! I don't know who I'd be if it weren't for me in ten years! Go ahead, show your stupid surprise. It's moments like this, and the subsequent arguments and fever dream-like edits, in which it's so funny and interesting to look back to the start of the show and reflect on how far it's devolved and how truly unqualified these people were to attempt a show like this. I think this was a great intro to the series for me, and likely would be for a lot of other people too. I see it as a sort of turning point for the series that represents the best of the show in its earlier years, and also teases the expansion of its universe without giving big plot points away. It was released near the end of the fourth season of On Cinema, a period in which the show was just on the verge of quickly morphing into the expanded concept it has since become. It's pre-Decker, but the show is already in progress, and Tim is teasing it as being on the horizon. It's pre-Dakar, but acquaints us with Tim's interest in songwriting and performing through the debut of his first song, and Greg's resistance to this activity. It introduces Mark and cements Joe as a mainstay of the series. The overall plot of the series has developed quite a bit more in the short time between the first annual and the second. Tim has undergone surgery to remove blood clots from his brain after previously declining treatment and resigning to die. He has brought his acupuncturist, Dr. San, on the show, who he now temporarily despises and disavows. He has divorced his wife and subsequently entered and ended a relationship with Ayaka, the foreign exchange student who was living with them. The second Oscar special lands at a time in which a number of story elements such as this, as well as the expanded universe elements, are growing and looming. Tim is mere weeks later about to find out that Ayaka is pregnant with his child. Just a few months after that, the first episode of Decker will be released. In this special, more than ever before, you can feel that Tim has one foot out the door on movie reviews, that he's beginning to resent the concept of his show. All the movie critics out there, I used to do this. I used to be a movie critic. During his Oscar fantasy, he's criticizing movie reviewers from the perspective of his future self as a successful actor. So you guys can go sit in your little corner and think you're God and tell everybody that what, they, what they should see and what they shouldn't see. But the trick is, this is what matters, is winning gold and becoming a successful actor. It clearly shows his mindset. He believes he's meant for more than what he's doing currently. This single moment is a clear indication for how the show is about to change. All this to say, the universe is really beginning to snowball into what it'll become. And the second Oscar special does a good job of getting you excited for that on top of being strong representation for the show as it then stood. I didn't know how to end this video, so- I was only hired to do two impersonations, WC and Char Charlie Chaplin, but you guys had me do um, the guy from The Mask. And so, I mean, that's an impersonation too that, you know, that I didn't get paid for. I didn't even know I was gonna do it. Cut to the back to Oscars, please.